April 1st, not really, but if for you, April 1st, 2014, I'm Justin, and also sitting on the couch with me is way over there this time. James. He remembers, and... Sequoia. That joke is getting old. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we are your hosts. We carry no credentials worth noting. That was Alex and the Anders. Tom, thank you for letting us use your music. Uh, wonderful. Super. Uh, we are a weekly topical podcast, and uh, we talk about what we think about things, and we'd like to know what you think about things. And so if you're interested, if you want to take part in everything, um, you can check out our website, ithinkyouthink.com. It will get you linked up with our Facebook page and our Twitter account and our uh, blog on Chicago Now. What else do we have? iTunes. 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 I didn't even know we had an iTunes. If you haven't seen our promo video, check it out. It's really cool. I'm hilarious. In it. It's true. Time travel? Time travel? Time travel. Anyway, so, uh, I Think You Think is uh, produced by Stolen Arts Productions, uh, which I did not say last week, but oh well. And we got uh, two big topics for you this week. Um, sort of a big topic. One of them is an r- awesomely huge topic and super great. And uh, the other one's really cool, too. So, yeah. Uh, Cosmos is one of them. That is true. Mm-hmm. Not the Cosmos, but the TV show that is on Fox. Miniseries. Miniseries. And we had mentioned we wanted to talk about tardigrades, so we can talk about some tardigrades. The water bears. Water bears. Uh, and uh, we've got a um, an article on here, the 25 uh, something or others. 25 most bru- brutal torture de- techniques ever devised. I'm so excited. From so list25.com. Yes, indeed. So, uh, link... In the underbar. I'm pretty sure somewhere. James is probably going to like get farther and farther away on the couch when we start talking about that, because I'm going to probably know most of them already. She has some of them saved with her. Honestly, home. if I was a millionaire, I would probably have quite a few of them in my home. That's disgusting. Just because they're awesome. Too much information. We're going to learn a lot today. About mm-hmm. Sakaya. But we want to start with the coolest, <laughs> the coolest, most awesome TV series that is on right now, and that would be a reimagining of Carl Sagan's Cosmos, A Personal Journey. Uh, this one is brought to us by uh, Steve, not Steve, uh, Seth MacFarlane uh, on the Fox Network. Um, it's Cosmos. I can't remember what the Space Time Odyssey. Space Time Odyssey, yes. Uh, and this one is, uh, because the, uh, late Carl Sagan is, has unfortunately left us. I miss him terribly. Superman and crushed on it. Like indeed. Uh, but we have a wonderful, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson that is hosting this show. And Sequoia might be the only person who has not seen any of the three episodes are out right now. By it's the true. time this show uh, airs, there, um, will be a fourth. there will be a fourth episode. Thirteen total uh, mm-hmm. in the end. Um, you got to see them. Well, you know what the worst part is, too, is that like a lot of my friends who have watched it are like, oh, Sequoia, you've seen Cosmos. Like, they assume that I've seen it already. I'm like, I have not watched any of it. And so I that disappointment, I don't just get it here. I get it at work. I get it in school. I get it, like, everywhere. And yet the peer pressure has not convinced I her mean, to actually I watch it. I usually the peer pressure. I this is I do not watch live TV, ever. Like it's all pre-recorded for me. Um, I watch that show live. If you couldn't tell from my Facebook posts. To be fair, I've only had a TV for like a week. Fair enough. Two so, weeks now, technically, based on when they've seen this. Okay, two True. weeks. Two weeks. But but who the, knows? By the, by time, the time you see this, say, maybe she will have actually gotten off her butt and watched it. I. Been or got a lot on of her time butt on my it. butt watching Bones. Aren't you almost done? No, I thought it was Teletubbies. Aren't you binge watching Teletubbies? On Actually, Netflix? it's uh, Backyardigans. Oh yeah. Backyardigans is uh, my shit. Are you serious? Because so. Backyardigans is actually pretty cool. I actually really cool. love Backyardigans. Backyardigans <laughs> is amazing. Like if I, I have to watch TV out. with Abby, I'm like, 
can we watch Backyard Again? <laughs> She's like, yes. <laughs> I know the whole opening theme song yeah. and the dance. Backyard Again is good. And yep. Will uh, show us the dance. No. The Backyard Poor Abby. <laughs> She's seen me do the dance. I'm better at it than <laughs> she is. <laughs> She's three years old. You should be able to pull out the dance better than her. <laughs> uh, no, Backyard Against is... I mean, that, that came out when... Uh, not Man. to get off topic, we when my son was sideways. a kid. Okay, yeah. but let's just yeah. talk about how awesome the yes, Backyard Against Cosmos. is for just a quick, quick okay. second. I know, I remember I was watching... The whole reason I even started actually paying attention was because I heard that, like one of the characters make a joke of like, Great Caesar's ghost! Yeah. He made the same joke like eight times that episode, and I was like, okay, I'm over it now. But a lot... Like the... Um, this is so nerdy. The episode that they did the uh, Lady in Pink and it was like the whole James Bond episode. Yep. That was amazing. Yeah. It was also, so a lot great. of their music. A lot of their music is really good. Yeah. Another another show that does the same type of stuff is, and you can make fun of me as much as you want, but Sweet. My Little Pony. Some of the music in that, they they borrow a lot of really good I'm not Broadway this stuff. journey with you, Justin. What? <laughs> you think you're taking this a solo ride? <laughs> are you a brony, Justin? <laughs> Yes, we, we already had this, this conversation. I just wanted you to admit it on camera again. Oh, okay. <laughs> the I drink either, By the right? way, I would love a... Um, I, I'm trying to find a plush of Twilight Sparkle. Um, a little one. I don't want a huge, gigantic one. I've got one of those. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, the only one. size he's missing. Yeah. Though, I, you know, I bought a stuffed animal for Becky for her birthday. It was a grumpy cat. I bought her a grumpy cat stuffed animal. It's pretty odd. Cosmos. <laughs> So, Sequoia, what did you think of Cosmos? Okay, that joke's old already. <laughs> what? That's the first time I told that one. Okay, in the podcast. You guys have been joking about Cosmos. It's true. Have you seen the old one, though, with Carl Sagan? You're missing out on another good one. However, I, I'm on Tumblr a lot, so I've basically seen a lot of these. Yeah, yeah. So, James, your take on Cosmos, because obviously I love it. <laughs> that is true. Um, I think it's amazing. I think um, there should be more TV that is like this because it's truly educational because all the educational channels or, you know, from the History Channel to the, the Learning, Learning Channel yeah. to the Science Channel, like, it's all Sasquatch and UFOs and it's just not solid science anymore. No. Nope. And I know that can be dull. Solid history, solid science can be dull. But it's very intriguing in its own right, and there's definitely a place for it, especially when you name your channel after that subject matter. Um, you know, if it's like shit that may be real channel, yeah, like the search for Sasquatch, let's put it on that channel. That's great. You know what I mean? Like, they or can we start su that channel? Suppose, <laughs> supposedly possible, like, creepy theories about the past. Sure, I'll watch that channel, but that stuff doesn't belong on a history channel. It's it's like it's Can we start it's, this channel, it's, please. They it's, already uh, did. Name the like the show the stuff. <laughs> it's gonna be Great. called it's gonna be called the Science Tainment Channel. You know, yeah, like mythical creatures we didn't actually find the Sasquatch episode. Well, watch a video for forty minutes of us talking about a, a thing that might be in these woods, but we don't actually ever find it. You know, I yeah. heard that apparently uh, Loch Ness monster sightings have dropped down like severely in the last five years, and okay. like the guy that like holds watch over the lock is like afraid that she's dead. Here's the thing. Here's the thing about ghosts, Sasquatch, all of that stuff. Systematically, in the last ten years, we've basically proven them all wrong. Every single person, for the most part, carries a camera in their pocket. Oh, constantly. Yeah. Videotaping. And we're not talking crappy, like, point-and-shoot little cameras. These these are four, five, eight megapixel cameras, which oh, yeah. is better than high def that you get on your television. For the for the amount of pixels you got. Oh yeah. The amount of sightings has not increased. It hasn't been like, hey, guess check out this ghost. You know, I mean, right. it, we have basically, I mean, if you could prove a negative, <laughs> we've basically done it. So, I'm sorry. Until there's some hard evidence. Ah. The whole other podcast. Yeah, that that goes into the whole burden of proof thing. Yes. But we won't get into that. Anyway, Cosmos. <laughs> yes, Cosmos. <laughs> we'll eventually so, stay on this one. What I was saying was that there should be more TV like this. Um, because it is, for all intents and purposes, hard science. It's stuff that we know to be true, have proven, you know, within the realms of what we know now. Because, I mean, it changes, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, hard fact now, a discovery changes things and alters things. And you'll learn that if you watch Cosmos. Um, but it's still very entertaining. And it's chock full of stuff. It's not like a lot of this TV where when you come back from commercial, 
they spend two and a half minutes replaying what happened before the commercial. Like you didn't DVR it or aren't watching it on demand or whatever, however you watch your TV. You know, like it goes into the next thing. So much so that when I watch these episodes a second time, I get more out of it. You know, there's stuff that I miss because, you know, unless you're really focused on watching it, like really intently and doing nothing else, you're never going to be able to absorb, absorb all of it, you know, because I'm always doing something else. Maybe I'm, you know, an email or something comes through on my phone. I'm checking that. Or maybe I'm playing around on my computer while I'm watching or whatever it is, you know. So even a second watch through, I'm still learning more. And it's really well done. Neil deGrasse Tyson is very engaging. There's a sincerity in his love of what he's teaching yep. and his love to teach it to people. It's not just that he loves what he's talking about, but he literally loves the fact that he's getting to give this to people. And that just comes through in every scene he's in. Um, you know, they show you the stuff in a myriad of different ways, whether it's just him explaining stuff on camera at all these different sites, because obviously it seems like they've gone like around the world. It's only been three episodes, and I feel like he's in so many different live locales when they're doing the filming. Um, full-on CGI stuff, whether it's the universe or down to the, like, DNA level, to this kind of, it's almost like the Telltale games. Yeah, like the kind I know what you're yeah, it's, uh, certain... it's, it's sort of like Cell Animation, but it's not as, Cell Animation has, this one reminds me of, like, Samurai Jack, um, uh, the Clone Wars, uh, Right. series uh, that was animated. It's it's a very inexpensive but good-looking animation. And they um, use it for when they're um, showing history scenes yeah. of human interaction. Yep. Um, and, like, they just, they piece it, it's all pieced together very well. Um, it's it's just amazing. I mean, it, it, I recommend it um, for adults, and if you have kids, have your kids watch it with you. They're going to learn a lot. Yeah, I mean a lot. I've I've learned a ton in three episodes, and I still haven't watched the third episode a second time yet. So there's more for me to learn. Yeah, it's. I mean, as as a huge fan of uh, Sagan's Cosmos, uh, which, like I've said, I've I've seen each episode at least five or six times, if not more. Some of them more because I like them more. Um, it's and I will be. Yeah, I know. It is. It is. It, I have an article on the blog. It's his comfort food or it is. whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, I have an article on the blog where after one of the uh, podcast, the, the uh, I Drink You Drinks, I was hammered. And mm-hmm. the thing that basically kept me from throwing up all over the place was laying down watching Cosmos because it made me feel better. Um, I love it. I think it's great. And this one, I that was the thing I was most worried about with this series. <laughs> Is I was afraid it wasn't going to be able to live up to Sagan's, uh, which was tremendous and great. And a lot of the science in it still holds true today. Uh, and the thing that I liked about Sagan's and I like about the, uh, Tyson's um, is uh, that they're honest about what they know, and they are they will complete they are free they will say you know this is the best that we have, you know, and they're completely honest that science isn't about knowing everything. It's about this is the best knowledge that we have right now. It could change in the future. It could even change by the person who's watching this right now, you know, some kid or something. Right. Um, and there's this great line of, uh, of uh, Tyson had a, a nice intimate moment with Sagan when he was growing up. In, in junior which, high? Huh? I think he was in junior high. Yeah, where he, yeah. he went to go meet him um, and spent time with him and and Sagan like Tyson loved to teach he loved to like he wanted to build up the future of science and the future of people to find things out because science is about standing on the shoulders of giants to look over the next hill right. um and uh was that from the show or did you just come up with that uh i've heard the term standing on the shoulders of giants before but I like that. yeah um it's it's a common theme especially in like the science world um you know, like like standing on the shoulder of Newton and Einstein and these great minds. Um, and the episode, the third episode, was about Newton. Right. Um, and many other people of that era and what they were discovering and some of the and, and great how, discoveries that yeah. collectively kind of... I mean, we take, we take for granted how much science is in our lives and we don't even think about how much science is in our lives. Sagan even actually wrote about that in The, the Demon Haunted World where he, he talked about the fact that we are a society that is becoming 
uh, completely dependent upon science and technology and have no understanding of what that science and technology is. Right. Um, and the dangers of that. That was his basic theme in the Demon Haunted World. Well, part, I mean, not to segue too far off what we're talking about, part of that is that although all of that is progressing, at, especially technology, at a seemingly exponential rate, our school programs of learning are not changing in any way, shape, or form. No. You know, it's not advancing with that. It's not, I mean, unless you get to the college level, um, which, which is fine. Clearly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's I don't know what's the matter. If you missed last episode. Now. Yeah, they obviously teach about similes now. But <laughs> that needs to be added into there as well. And the thing is, it's not like, I mean, this is a total huge segue. It doesn't need to be that every teacher needs to learn how to do it because now we have all of these abilities to generate a an entire like lesson plan in a digital format that can be given to the kids. Oh, no, like, okay, so like my, in my English class, the way that we do all of our classings is she has a WordPress blog. And when we walk in, it's projected onto the wall. Our journal, like we have to journal every day when we go. And so our journal is right there. And then we have assignments and we go on our phones and we comment on the blog post from our phones on there. So it gets projected right onto the big screen. And then she corrects in a lecture note that then gets posted to the blog for us to access at any time. Like that is integration. Right. And that should be happening in elementary schools. That should be happening. Because, I mean, I'm probably the most recent to have gone through, you know, the standardized schooling. And it is probably pretty much exactly the same as when you guys both went through. It probably has, like, my experience is probably not that much different. Yeah, you have, you have somebody who stands up at the front and lectures and you yeah. take notes and then you do a test at some point to test whether or not you've memorized yeah. those lectures. Yeah, well, and probably the biggest difference between I, me going through school and you guys going through school was I had to go through the No Child Left Behind school system. Yeah, I think it was just starting when I was nearing the end of my time. In, in, I think it was in high school when it really became bigger. Yeah, I was uh, in middle school when it really... I think I think it was like late elementary school, middle school when it really took place, and there was a shift. And you probably both had computers in your school probably from the beginning. Was that, I, I think I was like in third or fourth grade when my school got a, a handful of like old Apple computers. Like we had, we had computers, but we never used them. Like it wasn't there wasn't a class for it. We had a typing class to learn to type, which yeah. I never took. Um, but, uh, like, I remember there was a special, like, science and tech, kind of like a uh, woodshop type class, yeah. where you could learn how to do some basic programming commands to, like, make a arm move and pick something up and move somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that was it. Like, there, I remember there being some computers and some of the teachers, and most of the time they weren't used for anything other than whatever the teacher used them for. Yeah. My, my school got gifted an entire Macintosh lab uh, by, like, a millionaire dad or something like that. Some kind of huge windfall that my school got. We ended up getting, like, I think it was, like, 36 brand-new Macintosh computers when I was, like, in first grade. Yeah. So we had a really strong computer science program because they hired a full teacher just to deal with the Mac lab because they actually could now. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but... I mean, even then, like, I would say it wasn't really until I got to high school that there were computer classes, and even then, they were not anything great either. Well, a lot of it is, I mean, and we even know in our personal lives that you buy a computer, four years later, it's not really relevant anymore. Yeah. Especially the computers that most school districts would be able to afford. It's right. not like they're going to buy the top of the line across the board. Right. I mean, it'd be a smarter investment because you have to buy them half as often. Right. You know what I mean? So it probably and you wouldn't even out you wouldn't spend bit. twice as much for half right. as often. You'd spend only slightly. I think in high school we still had like the colored Mac. Do you remember those? Mm. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> they were they were the like the precursors to the all in ones. Yeah. Okay. You know, like yeah, the yeah, all in yeah, ones yeah. that are yep. now. Yeah, the white with like the clear Yeah. I think it was like oh these in Zoolander and they were like trying to get yes. in it. <laughs> They're inside <laughs> the computer. <Smash. laughs> <laughs> we had a whole Mac lab full of those. Uh, wow. uh, <laughs> yeah. So, Cosmos. Actually, no. I, I could I talk. Could participate I could talk for a lot uh, about it. Um, all for my. There are two things I don't like about it. One, believe it or not, there's things I don't. One, the episodes are too short. 
too short. You, I mean, if there's anything, but you have to realize that the original ones, uh, they're like an hour and fifteen minutes, and that's with no commercials. Right. Okay. So they were like hour and a half, hour and forty five minute original series, and these are an hour with commercials. So they're well, like an hour 40 and fifteen, to... no commercials for modern TV is two closer hours. to two hours. Yeah. Like if you add commercials, yes, in, it's, yeah. it's much closer to two hours. Yeah. Um, and it's too long, quite frankly, for most people's. Nowadays, yeah. certainly. Um, I, I love, because they pack so much into it. Right. Um, this one, I always feel like the last five minutes, I'm always like, how are they going to wrap this up? Because I feel like they're right in the middle of something. Um, I'm hoping that there's a bunch of stuff they've cut out and that it will be available on like a Blu-ray, DVD, whatever, when it comes out, uh, which I will be buying on the day it comes out or pre-ordering because I'm super excited about that. He's on Amazon every day waiting to see it. <laughs> when <up>. is it <laughs> pre-orderable? Notify um, me. So, so that's one of the things that that uh, that um, I really like don't like it. about it. Um, and it's not like I don't like about it. I just I wish they were. You longer. want you wish there was more. It's really yes. not a dislike. It's more of a. You like it. You have to have it. You want more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, and and then the second one is is more of like. It's it's really stupid, and it, it's going to seem. Um, no, it's not because it's not Carl Sagan. But uh, there are some scenes that they look pretty, um, like uh, the CG and everything, but they don't match to uh, the known science about it. For example, when they're showing the DNA, um, the molecules that are they're the wrong size. It's not right. It's this, the science is very understood about how what DNA looks like, and it looks pretty. And I know that they're trying to create this theme between the stars and the heavens and that cosmos and the inner cosmos and that our DNA and us, we are, we are star dust, which is another cosmos, or another cosmos, Carl another Sagan, Sagan saying, uh, quote, uh, that we are made of stardust. We are made of star stuff. Um, we are the, a way for the co- uh, cosmos to know itself. Um, and so I understand that it's, but for Tyson to be on there, who's the same person who, gave James Cameron hell because in the closing scene in the like closing scenes of Titanic he said your stars are in the wrong position of the sky you know or gives like uh, 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 John Stewart on the Daily Show a hard time because his wor- his earth rotates the wrong direction during the opening sequence you know so it's almost like a come on Tyson I mean I know he's not the creative mind behind it he's just the but so those are the only two things. They're really minor, silly, stupid things. But I, I think part of the reason why they might represent it differently is because they do a lot of like transition from one thing to another within that CGI. So you need to have that middle ground to be able to make that happen properly. So you're starting with one thing, knowing that at the end of this scene, it's going to, you know, break apart and turn into the other things. So, you know, I mean, but I I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and I would like to see more of it too. But we'll have to see what it's like after 13 episodes. Yeah, because you know I mean? there's there's a lot of stuff that they've already hinted at. Um, they they talked about like some of the great uh, extinctions, but they didn't talk about all of them. And he even mentioned there's this other hallway we're going to talk about later. Right. And it they haven't talked about it since that that was the second second episode. And and they didn't talk about it all in the third one. Yeah. Oh out. my gosh. But you won't know because you didn't watch. She's learning a lot from us. She doesn't need to watch it anymore. However, between that and the gifs on Tumblr, I'm good. Yeah. As a nice transition to our second topic, uh, in the second episode of Cosmos, they talked about this wonderful little uh, uh, creature that exists, probably in your backyard, but also in the, you know, the frozen ice, tundra. the frozen tundras, um, everywhere, basically on the planet Earth. If there was, if we were giving out awards for the most robust creature that has um, survived and is best suited to life on this planet, it would be uh, the water bear, the tardigrade, is what they're they're uh, scientifically referred to as. Um, and if you have not seen a picture of them, uh, I will try to remember to put a picture in the video right now. There it is. There we go. Or it isn't because I forgot. Uh, but you can go search. <laughs> you can go search for it on Google. You have the power of the Google. Yep. Um, they're adorable little things. Um, they look kind that might of... might be a bit of an overstatement. Well, 
somebody described that there is one picture that they described as it looks like a cannon wearing uh khaki pants basically and i with, said it was like origami with legs yeah origami paper yeah well, yeah. i said paper and then like five minutes later i was like origami origami is the word i was looking for on that one <laughs> <laughs> um no it's funny because we sort of like all like started like sending photos of them this yeah. last week i'm like i don't know if you guys actually looked at the one that i sent it was actually like a gif of a water bear no. i don't remember that at all. Like, i don't remember that yeah. one at all was it. it a link to a GIF? Yeah. Cause I don't, okay, because you can't send GIFs GIF. through no. Facebook yeah. messaging. Well, yeah. fine, I guess. That's yeah, it might. I might have well. seen the link when I was at work and never made it back to it. It was pretty amazing. Not gonna lie. Yeah. But, th- but they're awesome. They're like the size of a pin. You can see them in a normal microscope. Yep. Um, and the thing that I was most impressed about uh, is they're. I don't, are they the only thing that we know that survived all five? Mass extinction. At the very planet. least, it's specifically pointed out that it's it's yeah. one, you know it's possible that there are other species. Um, uh, for the most part, they they date back to the uh, Cambrian explosion, um, ish. Uh, we share a common ancestor with them about five hundred and twenty ish million years ago, which is, you know, most life comes out from that point. You right. know, they share common ancestors because that's when the body types tended to kind of seg segment seg meant off right uh is at that is at that point um so at the very least it certainly is you know one of the ones that's still around yeah there you go but anyways yeah they've (laughs) managed to survive all five of the mass extinctions that have happened on this planet um which in itself is noteworthy um and after watching that episode I'm not sure if I'll ever do it, but they made my list of possible tattoos because they're deserving. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like, I like the fact that you want to do a tattoo. If I was going to do a tattoo, I think I, I would, I would be willing to join you in that venture. I just don't know what would be best. Like, how are, how are they most photogenic? You know, that I, know, you I think do that, it, but... that one face forward one, where right. like you can actually see his face. That's a pretty. Yeah, yeah. So you'd have to have the right artist too, because of the nature of the way they look. Yeah, you, I want, to you wouldn't want to good screw at it up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, probably some more into geometric stuff too. I like the line. Yeah, I, and yeah. the way you'd want it probably designed, I would imagine. Yeah. Either way, it would take a while, and most tattoo artists, it's you charge, you get charged by the hour. So pretty much, yeah. Yeah, so it would be very expensive. Yeah, I don't um, even want to talk about how much that one cost me. Um, but yes, uh, they can even uh, uh, exist in the uh, um, vacuum yeah. of space. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, I think this the study they did they subject them to ten days. I think it was ten days in the vacuum of space, uh, because basically, and this is why they can survive so long, is what they do is they dry out for the most part until they're just this really hard shell, and then they can stay like that for decades. Um, and uh, and then you add water and they just pop back. Yeah, I mean they just they come back and they. Get, that's a great idea, actually. Like tardigrade, like sea monkey <laughs> things to sell. That's beautiful. You can't see them, but they're in there. I promise. <laughs> because you know, yeah. sea monkeys were definitely awesome to look at. <laughs> I never had them. I had too many real pets. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tardigrades, check it out. They are yeah. really cool. Um, you will yeah. get excited about them. Believe Selfish it or not. Bastards on the planet. Yeah, they're better than us. That's for sure. They'll be here after we're gone. <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, all right, so 25 most brutal torture techniques ever devised. New kids in the block, greatest hits. <laughs> um, the, it, it started off with this, it shows this video of the this bull here. Um, I don't think it ever talks about that one, though, does it? Oh, yep, it does. Okay, never mind. All the way down there at number 24. At number 24. So, number 25. Uh, uh, I will read these and then we can talk about how awesome they are. Sounds good. Um, so yes, this one is called The Tub. Uh, again, you can find this on uh, list25.com. Um, known as the punishment for sitting in the tub, the convicted person would be placed in a wooden tub with only their head sticking out. After that, the executioner would paint their faces with milk and honey and soon flies would begin to feed on them. The victim was also fed regularly and would end up swimming in their excrement. After a few days, maggots and worms would devour the body as they decayed alive. That's awesome. And very simple to do. All you need is a tub and some water and some honey. 
paintbrush if you really want to get fancy. Why don't they... Hang on. <laughs> no, mean, no, that, no, no, no. You, no, no it's... That would be more something like probably like medieval times. Mm-hmm. That would yeah. not be something that would be relevant today. It's That's disgusting. That would be a horrible way to go. I'll tell you that. The brazen bull. Yes, the brazen bull. I've heard of these. This is really exciting. You have not haven't heard of this no. one? No. Okay. So I, did not, I didn't hear of the last one either. All right, so number 24, the brazen bull, uh, also known as the Sicilian bull. It was designed in ancient Greece. A solid piece of brass was cast with a door on the side that could be opened and latched. The victim would be placed inside the bull and fire set underneath it until the metal became literally yellow as it was heated. The victim would then be slowly roasted to death, all while screaming in agonizing pain. The bull was purposefully designed to amplify these screams and make them sound like the bellowing of a bull. The person who invented this was killed in it. That is awesome. That's fitting. That's yeah. so cool. So the 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 king Thomas. or Caesar or whoever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was in Greece, so I don't know, but the whoever was the leader who commissioned it um, had it made, and then. Uh, I, I I think either the person who made it pissed off the person, or he wanted to test it out on the person who made it. It fitting human fashion of how we can do awful things to other members of our own species, let alone other species. So uh, tardigrades. Yeah, tart like tardigrades. Is impalement something people have to hear about? Impalement, yeah, twenty three is impalement. Given his name. It should come as no surprise that this was the most favored method of execution by Vlad the Impaler. In 15th century Romania, the victim was forced to sit on a sharp and thick pole. When then, I'm sorry, when the pole was then raised upright, the victim was left to slide down the pole with their own weight. It would take the victim three days to die using this method, and it has been said that Vlad did once did this to 20,000 people all while enjoying a meal. You know, he also, a uh, visiting dignitary, refused to take their hat off, so he nailed it to his head. Wow. Ouch. He was pretty good. What a crazy person. He was badass. I'm sorry, I love this stuff. (laughs) Like, this, you don't even, I love this stuff. Um, yeah, that's, (laughs) I'm interested in how they know the three, three days, like, somebody who, like, took. It's probably just probably probably somebody, yeah. yeah. All right, so this one is called uh, the Heretic's Fork. So uh, this torture device uh, consisted of a metal piece that uh, two opposed bi- bi-pronged forks attached to a belt or strap. One end of the device was pushed under the chin and the other into the sternum, and the strap was used to secure the victim's neck to the tool while the victim hung from the ceiling or was somehow suspended so that they could not sleep. If their heads dropped, the prongs would pierce their throat and chest. I'm not, I've never seen one of these That's disgusting. Ouch. All right, neck torture. Uh, This is 21. Humiliating and painful, this punishment was something of an endurance test where the victim would be hooked into a neck device either made of metal or wood, which prevented the victim from adjusting into a comfortable position. The cruelty of this punishment lie within the fact that they were unable to lie down, eat, or lower their head for days. So basically it's just like this neck brace with with, uh, spikes all all the way around it. Remember you like Wild Wild West? Remember that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. They on. had, yeah. Yeah, they had, like, yeah. Uh, crucifixion, um, number 20. So, principally practiced in antiquity, though it remains practiced in some countries today. It is one of the most well-known execution methods due to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Uh, it is deliberately slow and painful execution where the condemned person is tied or nailed to a large wooden cross and left to hang... Uh, until they die, which usually takes days. And uh, you die from uh, not being able to breathe, Mm -hmm. from suffocation, basically, because fluid built up around your lungs. And you just, you have to lift your body up in order to get your your breath. It's a pretty awful way. Um, Think about that for the thing that you're wearing around your neck. (laughs) (laughs) You know, just uh, just show your thing. Nobody wants to see that again. Uh, Number 19, the Judas Cradle. Uh, James, you'll like this one. Lord, no. <laughs> closely, oh, re- I've seen that one. closely related to impalement, this gruesome punishment entailed having the victim sit on the pyramid-shaped cradle, which uh, after which they would be uh, forced down on it by ropes, with the intent of stretching the victim's orifice over a long period of time, slowly impaling them. 
To add to the overall humiliation, the victim was usually naked, and the device was rarely washed, so if the torture did not kill you, the infection contracted from it would. Ow. Yeah. Uh, the lead sprinkler, number 18, usually filled with molten lead, tar, boiling water, or burning o- or boiling oil. It was used to torture victims by dripping the contents onto their stomach or other body parts like the eyes. Using this device, the torturer would proceed to pour molten silver on the victim's eyes, which resulted in agonizing pain and eventually death. Oh my god, this is my favorite. This I love one. the Iron Maiden. Okay, it's so, so cool. number 17, the Iron Maiden. This torture device uh, consisted of an iron cabinet with hinged front and spike-covered interior sufficient enough to enclose a human being. Once inside its conical frame, the victim would be unable to move due to the great number of steel spikes impaling them from every direction. The interrogator would scream questions at the victim while uh, poking them with jagged edges. I don't know if it talks about it, but some of these actually come out of uh, the um, the Spanish Inquisition, mm-hmm. the time of the a Spanish Inquisition, of them, yeah. Yeah. Um, in which they were asking, you know, basically they were trying to find all the heretics, or yeah. you know, and during. Uh, medieval times and the Renaissance, there was also a lot of, mostly Dark Ages. Yeah. 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 A lot of really, like, intricate torture devices were created. And Salem Witch Hunts as well. There was a lot of torture. Just goes to show you what uh, can happen when you set your mind to it. (laughs) Yeah. The things you can come up with. Uh, Coffin torture. This is 16. The most preferred torture technique in the Middle Ages was known as coffin torture. This method involved placing the victim inside a metal cage, roughly the size of the human body, hence the name. The torturers also forced overweight victims into smaller cages to heighten their discomfort as they hung from a tree or gallows. Generally, they would be left there until the crows came to feed on their remains. So, this is actually... You've seen these are in TV. They've had these yeah. in movies and stuff. Yeah, they'll like have that. the skeletons laying them yeah. in them all the time. Yeah. A lot of video games have stuff like that left yeah. over. Actually, uh, Skyrim, yep. uh, Oblivion, at the very least as well. Um, same type of stuff. Um, yeah, thumb screws. Ouch. Very Number fifteen. So, uh, though there are many variations of this torture device, the thumb screws or pillywinks. Pillywinks? Pillywinks, yeah. P I L L I W I N K S. Pillywinks. I feel like. Sounds like a fun name. That would kind of take the edge terrible. off a little bit. Um, Pillywinks. They, they, well, they, they probably had a good marketing team. So. <laughs> well, I, I'm pretty sure they were prevalent in several different eras, so. <laughs> uh, they all function the same. They were designed to slowly crush not only the fingers and toes, but larger devices were also used to crush knees and elbows. There is also the head crusher, which could do the same for heads. Its primary intention was to extract confessions from victims, and it was the first used in medieval times. Ow! Yeah. Wow. Because you'd, you'd hear and feel the cracking in your skull. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the truth is that these things don't get actual confessions out of people. People just start saying whatever they can to stop it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Know. Just uh, hopefully they'll stop it and just kill you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah if you're lucky. If you're lucky. Uh, Rope torture, um, 14. Uh, A rope is the easiest to use of all torture devices since it is easy to find and can be easily fashioned to inflict a number of terrible retributions. For example, it could be used to tie the victim to a tree, leaving the victim exposed with no way of defending himself from animals or other humans. It could be used to hang victims at the gallows for entertainment purposes while ultimately inflicting death. And it could be fashioned to restrain the victim's limbs while attaching the other end to horses who would uh, yep. them be made to run, consequently severing the limbs. Another thing that they would do is they would tie people up by their uh, wrists and then hang them from the ceiling and then tie, uh, like, rocks to the bottom of their feet and then, like, drop them and then right before they hit the bottom, like, pull, pull them on. back up again and disjoint their arms. This is a weird, weird side to you. <laughs> Why? <laughs> you're like super hippie and all of a sudden you're like torture devices. <laughs> no, this like, is how it works. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best idea ever. I don't know. I just, I think, these, I don't know. I've always thought these things were really cool though. Like one of my friends went to a shop in downtown Chicago recently and told me that they have like an authentic electric chair switch there for sale. And I'm like, this is 
so cool. Why do you think I like oddities? It's because I like, actually would buy a lot of that stuff. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Creepy house. Yeah, I would totally have a creepy house. <laughs> if I had, like, yeah. Oh, it'd be a problem. Anyway. So many things we are learning today. <laughs> I reject this as a torture device. Yeah. I don't think it's actually a torture device. Actually, it's a death uh, instrument. This is this is one of the ones that I was like, eh, I don't, it's not. It, it was supposed I to guess be the great. Depends equalizer. on how sharp it is. Yeah, that's true. The the guillotine. The guillotine number yeah. thirteen. Uh, one for those who don't know, one of the most notorious forms of execution, especially during the uh, French Civil War. Uh, the guillotine was made of a razor sharp blade uh, attached to a rope. The victim's head was placed in the middle of the frame. As the blade dropped, severing the victim's head from the body, since the decapitation was considered to be instant and painless event, at least less painful than other torture methods, it was often considered the most humane punishment for execution. It was also supposed to be... Um, the biggest problem with beheadings uh, is uh, with axes and things like that, which is how typically people think of people getting beheaded with an axeman, uh, is it's hard to swing an axe and hit the mark. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so... Not to mention sever it in right. one blow, and sometimes they would miss, and so it was it was a rather painful time. Um, if you read up on some of the history of like the uh, the the um, wives of Henry the Eighth, did you want to take some notes? Yeah, yeah. I probably know. There was that. there was one, and I can't I I can't remember her name, but she specifically asked to be beheaded by with a sword because swords are sharper, um, and they will normally slice through in one go. They're also easier to aim than axis because the weight is here and not way up here. Right. Um, but the guillotine, it was actually invented to be a more humane way. It was invented to be an equalizer because they were beheading a lot of French nobles and mm-hmm. um, upper classmen and it was the people who were, you know, killing them. Um, the they, only... it took place it took place shortly after our revolution. The only thing is that there is a few seconds of consciousness after the head is severed. Yes. Which yeah. obviously they wouldn't have known. Right. You know, didn't have the kind of science. Yeah, there was actually a, uh, there was a scientist at the time who, uh, one of his uh, assistants or something got in trouble and and was going to get beheaded. And so he approached him about, hey, can we do this, this test where after you are beheaded, I want you to try to blink as often, as many times as you can. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the reasons they knew that they were still conscious, you know, is they would, uh, he, he blinked like, it's, it's the same. You know, I think it's like a chicken with its head being cut off, being run, running around for a while. So it's like nerves firing off. And, yeah, you yeah. Know. So I'm sure it's not wonderful or super great. Probably not. A no. lot of pain. Okay, so the rack is number 12. I know, right? No worries. Did, yeah, we'll yeah. have to sort of swing through these. Yeah, everybody knows quicker. kind of what the rack is. Yeah. It pulls your arms out, yeah. The tongue terror. Which is exactly what it sounds like. Yeah, it rips your tongue out, or they pull your tongue out and then just cut it off. Um, I was like, that's not anything. Oh, we gotta go to the next page. Jeez, I hate these. Just put it all on one page. All right, number ten, uh, rat torture. So basically, they put a little box uh, over your body, um, uh, and uh, throw rats in this box so that they can't get out. And then they add a heating element somewhere nearby, and the rats flee that heating element and dig and claw their way into your body in order and to try you and through out. Yeah. Yeah, this was in one of the episodes of Game of Thrones, actually. They what? I think it was in an episode of Game oh, of Thrones. Oh, Game of Thrones. Okay. Spoilers. Yeah. Okay, I have a bone to pick. The, the, the chair, chair of torture. torture. I have seen this chair in person. Okay. I was in third grade, and it was a museum that I went to with my school, on my school trip, and they only let us look at it for, like, a minute before they were like, oh, God. <laughs> like, you know, hurried all little school children out of the room of torture that they didn't know was the exhibit at the time. So I made my parents take me back, like, a couple months later, and the exhibit was gone, and I never got a chance to actually look at the chair, like, for real. Yeah, but that's not the chair's fault. Yeah. But... It's just, it's an interesting story, but maybe explain some things. We never need to make her mad. At least she doesn't know any of, any of this stuff. Yeah. Yet. Cement shoes sound, is exactly what, you know, the mob used it. Put your blah, 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 throw you in. You drown. Uh, the breast ripper. Which is exactly what it sounds like. Exa- yeah. Uh, uh, also, I think, uh, was uh, used a lot during uh, Spanish Inquisition mm-hmm. and many of the other times. Uh, crocodile shears. So they would mutilate um, appendages and tear them off their bodies. Um, ouch. 
Republican marriage. <laughs> that's what it's called. <laughs> but it's that's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> so, besides the guillotine and burning at the stake, this act of torture was employed by Jean-Baptiste Carrier um, during the French Revolution and involved binding naked males and females together and then throwing them into icy waters to drown. When the water was unavailable, they would just run uh, through with swords or bayonets. This was the preferred method used to execute nuns and priests during that time. I think I prefer that to being married to a Republican. Just saying. Uh, uh, breaking wheel. Um, slowly kill the victim. First, the victim's <laughs> limbs were tied to spokes. Oh, they would basically spin a person on this wheel, and they would keep trying to smash their their arms and things like that. It's like whack a mole. Yeah, basically. Yeah, the Spanish oh, this one's Spanish rock. donkey. Uh, it's basically like a sawhorse. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, has a rather jagged, disgusting uh, center to it, and you straddle it, and they add weights to your legs and rip you in two, basically right up the middle. Don't uh, look at me. I'm, not, <laughs> I'm just. I keep looking this direction. I'm trying to make sure I'm. Uh, saw know. torture, and this picture is amazing. Yeah, they okay. hang them upside down and then saw them in half. And yeah. saw them in half. Basically like the saw, the, the, um, Spanish donkey, but, you know, sawing. Ow. Uh, and they've got this nice little, like, drain below the body. Uh, and then the last one is the hang drawn and quartered. Uh, Which they already touched on briefly. They talked a little bit about the ropes. The hang drawn yeah. and quarters, the, there's specifics to it, like they castrate the victim, they hang them first by the neck and then let them down, and then they castrate the victim. Uh, and in some cases actually show the part to the person who they are going to kill uh, yeah. and then attach uh, their arms um, to horses. And Yeah. I remember in the, the book part. that I read about this, in, which I probably read when I was like in fourth grade, so I probably really shouldn't have had it. It was in one of those, do you remember those, um, in hindsight, do you remember those eyewitness <laughs> books? Do you remember those? With like all the, like it'd have like, you know, like, I remember it was like an eyewitness book where they'd have like, they had like one for costumes and different parts and it would be like a, it'd show something from the era and then point out all these parts of it. And I remember I had this one that was on the Middle Ages and it had this whole cross section of a castle and it had stuff like it showed in the dungeon, there was a little forget me not, which was like a sub dungeon in the dungeon where they'd shove people and like, put it over and then just leave them in there. So, like, bones would build up in there and they'd have to clean out the bones and put new people in. And But they showed someone being hang dr- hung, drawn, and quartered in the little cross-section thing. And then there was another thing where they would, like, eviscerate them, but they would do it quickly enough that they could do it and pull out their intestines while they were still alive and light them on fire. Like, they would do all kinds of stuff like that. Like, I remember it was all in this, cr- this one cross-section of this castle where they showed stuff like that, and like I was in fourth grade, and it was like my favorite thing ever. So, and uh, dark side. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, um, and will... she might hate puppies. <laughs> I love puppies. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, we will see you all next week. <laughs> uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for um, uh, being part of the show and sending us emails and um, listening and everything that uh, you all do out there. Um, we didn't touch on it last week, but, uh, StravaMax.com, mm-hmm. young lady Strava that did Max. all of our, um, uh, graphics, and, uh, I did it at the beginning, but, uh, Alex and the Anders, thank you, Tom, and your group, so, uh, thanks for joining us, and, uh, we'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.